If I was American Express, I would either keep an eye out on them or I would throw some money to acquire them. Hey guys, it's Sebastian from Ask Sebi. Today we are going to look at the five companies trying to take the throne away from American Express and Chase. As always, chapters tool down below, so if you get bored of a specific part, feel free to hop around. Big favor from you guys, give this a thumbs up, and if you are someone new here, consider subscribing. I've been getting pretty curious with this because every few months, either a company is raising more money or a new one is launching. And a lot of these are either debit cards or credit cards. These aren't fly-by-night operations. They're startups that have raised hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars from venture capitalists who actually know the space rather than just rich people trying to throw money into a blood testing startup. They can still fail the same way that an NBA player can be a complete bust and even if they're drafted very well and there's high expectations, but generally there's still some substance behind the noise. For most of these fintechs, the strategy is to use a debit card to plant their seed and then move into either credit cards or other financial instruments. The reason they start with debit cards is actually pretty interesting, but maybe a bit boring, so hopefully I don't put you guys to sleep. This is the one area where startups can really stand out compared to the big banks, given the rules involved. For big banks, the interchange fee is kept at 21 cents, plus 0.05% of the transaction, and also one cent for fraud prevention. The middle number isn't 0.5%, it's 0.05%. Doing the quick math for a $10 purchase, you have 21 cents plus 0.5 cents, and let's round that up to one cent, plus additional one cent, that's 23 cents. If we increase that purchase to $100, so 10 times the amount, that's still only going to be 27 cents once you do the math. Even at $1,000, it's only 72 cents. Smaller issuers, so those of less than $10 billion in trust assets under management in the prior year, are exempt from this. Depending on the type of card, they can charge up to 1.44% for Visa and 1.46% for MasterCard. So going back to that $10 purchase, that's going to be $0.37. Cents. $100 purchase, interchange fee is now $1.68. $1,000, that's $14.82. These numbers might sound pretty small, but if you have 4 million account holders, then these numbers start to add up pretty quickly. Due to the rules involved from the Durbin Amendment to the Dodd-Frank Act, these big banks just can't compete. The second part of this is that these fintechs know that Gen Z will be the tastemakers. I'm a millennial and it hurts me to say that when I was 20, I thought of 30 year olds as pretty old people who didn't really have much taste. A lot of this is going to be about changing preferences. Let's take a look at Motley Fool. Gen Z is focused on no annual fees, insurance and other protections and other. In contrast, millennials are focused on rewards and also low interest. Gen X cares about the credit limit, rewards, hello everyone, and also the recognition of the brand that they're working with. Put another way, Gen Z cares about no fees and also other benefits. It's not a surprise that these fintechs and also some other bigger competitors are doing well because they're resonating with this audience. Given this, let's look at some of the debit and credit cards going for the throne. The first card is going to be Apple. By no means are they a small company, but they are a new competitor in this space. Apple has an amazing playbook. Simplicity. No fees, not even hidden ones. Powered by Apple. This actually ties into their grand plan and how they operate as a big company. A really good example of this is AirTags. I would consider myself a technologist and back in 2016, five years ago, I bought Tiles. Ironically, I was pretty late to this because the company started in 2012. It was pretty much a square that would track where your belongings were. If that sounds familiar, it's because Apple just released AirTags in May of 2021 and innovated the whole space. Even though this existed for a long time, Apple took what worked and made it even better and just marketed it better. Something that was a pretty niche item is now a whole product category. Unlike a lot of the other fan companies, or I guess it's now Manga, so Meta, Amazon, Netflix, Google, as well as Apple, Apple tends to put a lot of resources behind what they're working on. If they're going to do something, they're going to make sure it's successful. As straightforward and simple as the Apple Card is, I've had a ton of people ask me whether that's actually better than the Chase Sapphire Reserve. Fundamentally different cards, but it earns a percentage back, it's metal, and it's also very simple. If Apple decided to double down on this space, I could easily see them launching a travel card. Imagine a card that had a pretty great app and it tracked flight prices and also did refunds for you if it was something that didn't make sense. So for example, canceling your Southwest flight and rebooking it because it's cheaper. As crazy as this sounds, Apple Care is owned by Apple and they're pretty good at underwriting. I don't think Apple will let you transfer your points or your cash back to airline partners anytime soon, due to some exclusive contracts that these companies have with the other banks, but in the long term, you never really know. Apple has a ton of power. For example, Apple is one of United's biggest clients, and they make them $150 million a year. Apple spends so much money with United that United is upgrading their terminal for them. If by and large tells you to jump, then you better jump. The second one is Current, and they're also the sponsor of today's video, but they did promise me that I could be myself and cover the pros and the cons. 
As meta as that probably sounds, this is a core advantage. They know how to work with creators and creators want to work with them, whether it's Emperor Chamberlain or Mr. Beast. I would say that viewers aren't stupid and they can tell when you're not being yourself. They're also number three on the list of most active users, so it definitely puts them in an interesting spot. The really cool thing is that they seem pretty agnostic to your financial position. On the more subprime side, you can get paid up to two days faster on your direct deposits. Definitely helpful when you're still building out your positions. They also have things like overdraft up to $100 without fees. In the mid-stage, when you're more focused on convenience, you can send money to other current members. There's also 40,000 fee-free ATMs from Allpoint in the US. You can also mobile deposit or deposit at over 60,000 stores. On the advanced side, there's a ton of other point earning opportunities. They have a premium account where you can get up to 15x points on your purchases. The premium account is $4.99 a month, but the basic one is free. Run the numbers to make sure that it actually makes sense. One other competitive advantage is that they're copying a pretty good playbook, the same one that Apple runs. People new to financial services generally love this because it makes things a lot simpler. 4.7 average and over 99,000 reviews. So if that sounds interesting, then use the link down below in the description box or go to current.com slash asksebi. The purpose of this video, I'm pretty bullish given their understanding of the creator space and also how they're positioned. They also raised $220 million from Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the top venture capital firms in April of 2021 at a $2.2 billion valuation basically 3xing from November 2020 when they were only worth $750 million. Andreessen Horowitz is also one of the top venture capital firms, and I would not be surprised if Current moves into credit cards after. Number three is going to be Chime. The pro is that they're the whale in the space, and I feel like they do a pretty good job of marketing. Very big emphasis on no fees and also their ATM network. To me, they're pretty much the Robin Hood of the space. They're looking to go public at either a $35 to $45 billion valuation in 2022. In case you're wondering, they last raised $750 million at a $25 billion valuation in August of this year, so a few months ago. Cons, I would say that they're more subprime focused, and this isn't necessarily bad, but if you compare it to something like the high net worth group, you don't need as much of those people in order to be a very successful company. One high net worth person might be worth 100 subprimes. One thing you'll notice is that a lot of these people do the same things. They also do no fees. You can get your direct deposit up to two days earlier, and also overdraft coverage. For them, it is $200 in overdraft coverage, which is a little bit higher, but yeah, pretty much the same things. One interesting thing is that Chime does not have a premium version and it might not be in their game plan. Instead though, they do have a secured card to help you build your credit. My guess, and maybe this is very big brain or small brain, is that they're going to push more towards the credit card side because they're probably hitting the ceiling for the debit card interchange fees. They know at some point they're going to break through that 10 billion AUM number, so it's making sure that they have a plan afterwards. I do think that Chime is the closest one to being a full-fledged institution. The big question though is whether that's Chase or Synchrony. Also trying to figure out how to convert these people that have been very focused on debit cards and are more subprime to these credit card products. Number four is going to be Oxygen. A lot of these companies focus on the number of users rather than the value of a user. Oxygen is focused on small businesses and also freelancers who tend to spend more money and also be worth more as a customer. They came out of YC, Y Combinator, which is a pretty good checkmark in my book, and their valuation is 500 million. They do have a tier system, but it's a bit complicated. I'm a fan of complicated because that's just how I work, but that's not going to be for everyone. I feel like the messaging and the fact that there is some complexity means that they're focused on Prime and also Super Prime. The fact that they have things like travel insurance, Peloton, as well as Netflix reimbursements, and also even Priority Pass means to me that they're focused on this demo that doesn't want to get credit cards or isn't able to get it yet, but they want those benefits. This makes a ton of sense given the interchange thing that we talked about at the beginning of the video. So if you have these people who spend a ton of money, but who don't or can't get a credit card, then why not put them into this debit card? My fear is that maybe it's too small of a niche. So yes, maybe everyone does become a small business and that's the future, then great. But if not, then you're kind of in this weird spot where you're appealing to these people who want to start businesses, but at the same time, who just don't want to get credit cards. And I feel like for most people, you eventually evolve from debit cards to credit cards. That feels like the natural flow. Given the branding and everything else going on, I think it fits the best of American Express. And if I was American Express, I would keep an eye out on them and maybe even buy them out. Let me know if it makes sense to do a full-fledged video on these cards because there is quite a bit of nuance and leveling to it. Referral link for Oxygen down below if you want to check them out. Number five is Point, and it's a pretty interesting one. They're also positioned as an anti-credit card, and to me, it feels very much like the debit card that Dave Ramsey would get if he were to recommend one. Think premium credit card for people who spend a decent amount, but with credit card benefits. Also seems to be a pretty substantial focus on boost and cash back, so these limited time promotions. They also just raised $46.5 million in a Series B. 
given how valuations work, you can generally times this by five to figure out what they're worth. So probably about 230 million. YC backed as well, and also backed by Peter Thiel. $49 annual fee, and it comes with a lot of the protections you would expect on a card like the Chase Sapphire preferred. Trip cancellation, car rental insurance, global travel. Also a fan favorite is phone protection. Referral link down below if you want to check them out. My question for you guys is which of these cards do you think is the best positioned to take that crown? Let me know down below. If you're not impressed with these cards and you want to learn about credit cards, we do have links on our website, asksebi.com, and also down below in the description box. Make sure the cards are competitive for you and that they fit your lifestyle, but otherwise, huge way to support the channel. If you like to give it a thumbs up, and if you know anyone else who might benefit, share this with them. It'll probably help them out. Otherwise, hope you guys liked it. See you guys next time.